When I hear the name Lin Tian Shan, memories of those days, really good days, come flooding back. We all got on so well together. Life for everyone there was good. Many residents have since moved away. But as long as we continue doing our best to sustain Lin Tian Shan's community and heritage, it is good for Taiwan as well as for our children and future generations to come. With over a century of history, it deserves to be treated as something special. The main focus of the Forestry Culture Park is, of course, Lin Tian Shan Forestry's physical heritage. But the business of forestry relied on the community here at Lin Tian Shan. We should talk more about this relationship. This old treasure is still a treasure. For a century, Lin Tian Shan was a source of community, employment, and valuable natural resources. Although logging ended in the 1980s, the old logging village has remained and thrived. Why? How did the village survive the end of logging? What drove residents to make sure that Lin Tian Shan would remain a vital community for decades to come? The story starts more than a century ago, when the area's forestry pioneers laid Lin Tian Shan's robust modern foundations. Soon after acquiring Taiwan in 1895, Japan launched a comprehensive survey to inventory the island's natural resources. The effort to investigate Taiwan's forest resources began in 1910. However, completion of this survey was delayed until after the colonial government had forced East Coast indigenous tribes to relocate from mountain tribal lands to new lowland villages. The Colonial Forestry Office surveyed Hualien and its forests, including what would become Morisaka Logging District. What was found exceeded all expectations. Vast tracts of prized cypress and other trees. An enterprising Japanese company, rather than the colonial government, was the first to step forward to develop this treasure trove of timber. This time out, our main goal is to reach Hualien County's earliest commercial scale logging area, which is along the old Morisaka log rail line. We set out on foot from the old Xilin line and are hiking this forestry footpath upward toward our destination. To shed light on its century old origins, the Forestry Bureau's Hualien District Office and a team from National Donghua University are hiking into the mountainous districts of Lin Tian Shan and Da An Shan in Wanrong Township, hoping to recover important historical evidence from the site. Two of the team members, Ming Yi Zhuang and Jin Ming Fong, while born and raised near Lin Tian Shan village, are heading to a place even their parents and grandparents may have never seen. Founded in Kalenko in 1918, the Higashi Taiwan Lumber Company began logging at Lin Tian Shan along the lower reaches of Shoufeng Stream. At first, skidways were used to move logs to Hirabayashi Station for onward shipment by rail to lumber mills near Kalenko Harbor. With facilities now fully up and running, the firm upped its invested capital in 1919 and merged Higashi Taiwan Lumber into the newly formed Kodinko Lumber Company, creating Eastern Taiwan's largest privately held logging and lumber firm. 
Cotton Co. Lumber installed a new light rail handcar line at Lintian Shan to boost log handling capacity and lumber production. But the depletion of accessible timber after eight years of logging led Cotton Co. Lumber to shift its focus with colonial government permission to the untapped forests at Da'an Shan, for which new transport facilities were needed. Logs were moved primarily by rail and skidways at Lintian Shan, both of which were human-powered and labor-intensive. With the timber gone, they moved to Da'an Shan. Drawing on their Lintian Shan experience, in 1929, they installed four sections of track and three sections of cableway, totaling over 20 kilometers, which greatly streamlined log transportation. Cotton Co. Lumber used a combination of rail tracks and cableways to navigate over the area's extreme topography. Stops along the way up, including Anlai, Jianfan, Zhongye, and Chujian, were gradually installed. The success of this dual rail and cable approach led to its adoption across all of Hualien's logging districts. Walking up from below, you can see that this area here is a large level platform. This is where Dan Shan District's number one cableway dispatch point used to be. The smaller rectangular foundation just off to the side there may be where the Anlai manager's dormitory was situated. A rock line drain was installed here. These were installed nearly a century ago. That's quite a long time. Not likely that much would be left now. However, we can still sense its importance because logs arriving here, having passed across four rail lines and three cableways, would be transferred onto flatbed rail cars for shipment to Hirabayashi Station. Regrettably, this efficient transport system failed to make Cotton Co. Lumber's fortune. An economic recession and competition from cheaper imports led to poor earnings and another shift in focus to Mokuizan logging district. This brought to a close nearly 15 years of Cotton Co. Lumber logging in the Lintian Shan Da'an Shan region. But Lintian Shan wouldn't remain quiet for long. Much larger scale forestry efforts in the Morisaka logging district lay just around the corner. In the late 1930s, the Japanese conglomerate Taiwan Kogyo Corporation set its sights on the vast, untapped forests in the Morisaka logging district's large claim across the eastern central mountain range. In 1938, Taiwan Kogyo won a government permit to log the district's forests based on its stated need for a reliable source of paper pulp. However, all timber not used for pulp, including the area's valuable cypress, was to be turned over for public use and sale. Headquartered in today's Ilan County, Taiwan Kogyo Corporation was primarily a paper manufacturer and had no commercial forestry experience. The colonial authorities thus dispatched Akashi Sokichi to lead the work at Lintian Shan. The administrative center created by Akashi still stands today in Lintian Shan Forestry Culture Park. Under colonial government supervision, Taiwan Kogyo began securing permits and purchasing the private land necessary to set up their forestry operations base. News of Taiwan Kogyo's plants spread quickly, and the area was soon flooded with people looking for job opportunities. New offices, factories, dormitories, workshops, and staff breathed life into the new village of Morisaka.
a new flatland railway spur line, and the log rail Wentran line, leading to the number one cableway dispatch point, were both finished in 1939. With the completion during the following year of cableways 1, 2, and 3, all was in place to begin logging in the first target area, Daguan. Up the Wentran line and across three sections of cableway brought you to Daguan. Because it was so important, a lot of attention was given to the development of Daguan. The very first load of logs sent down the cableway were sent from this spot. Concurrently, this was the start of the Daguan rail line, which ran for a dozen or so kilometers to its terminus at Qingshuigu. The research team now strikes out beyond Lintianshan and Daanshan into forests first logged by Taiwan Kogyo. The team is now in an area quite familiar to Mingyi and Jinming. Every summer vacation, young Jinming rode the cableway with his father to Daguan, hiking into the woods beyond to his worksite. Mingyi had frequently heard about Daguan as a place buzzing with fun and activity. That over there used to be a guest house and a public bathhouse. There was another next to it as well. Then there were three or four worker dormitories. There were quite a few over there too. Key work areas were located higher up, like the train garage and storage shed for traction sand. The work areas spread out from the track and living quarters were located below. There was no school here, and Daguan village was only formed after the war. This was a maintenance garage. Engines went in for scheduled maintenance, and would be rotated around afterward. When one left for Qingshuigu, the other would remain on standby here. When I was a kid, you could go non-stop. The engine connected all the way in. The area's high humidity and rains have been hard on these wooden structures. Today, only those buildings made of cement and the three-way rail turnout remain. Machinery perched on a mountain peak marks the former number three cableway dispatch point and its currently mist-cloaked views of the eastern Rift Valley and Lintian Shan Forest. From 1941, Taiwan Kogyo's logging efforts pushed ever deeper inland from Daguan, with the company continuously expanding all aspects of its forestry business and steadily increasing output volumes. Strong growth continued for several years, until the turning tide of war sent the industry into a tailspin. Japan's unconditional surrender in 1945 led to Taiwan's transfer to nationalist China. Taiwan Pulp and Paper Corporation took over affairs at Lintian Shan in 1946 under the renamed Lintian Shan Management Office and reinstated active logging operations. Lintian Shan was a prosperous place back then with plenty of people and equipment. But the ground everywhere was still dirt, and houses were all made of wood. Only a few houses, those built by the Japanese, had roofs covered in clay roofing tiles. The management office was expanding, and the number of employees swelled. 
New offices and dormitories were built, but roofs no longer used clay tiles. Lin Tianshan's two main cypress species gave wood that was resistant to water and rot. So we milled these to roof tile specifications so they could be laid one over another as wooden roof tiles. And these wooden tiles were great. But fire was always a concern at Lin Tianshan. So fire prevention was always a priority. The number of forestry workers at Lin Tianshan rose to over 500 under TPPC administration. The lowland administrative center at Morisaka expanded accordingly. This growing community gradually added new worker dormitories at Kongla New Village, a new community center, and Sunrong Elementary and Linchang Kindergarten for the children of worker families. Commercial forestry efforts proceeded outward from Daguan and Qingshuigu in the direction of Gaoling. Gaoling was the furthest extent of logging during the Japanese colonial period and was home to the largest work camp in early post-war Taiwan. The relatively flat land at Gaoling supported a stable worker community with offices, workshops, guest houses, dormitories, company store and sapling nursery. Back in the day, Gaoling's bustling allure was only slightly less than that of Daguan. This tunnel is midway between Cableway Dispatch Point 4 and Cableway Arch 5, so it's the midpoint on the Gaoling Line. Exiting the tunnel brings you to the entrance of Gaoling Station. On the left there was the admin center, and senior manager offices were there on the right. A bridge used to connect the two. Walking further down the tracks, on the right side there, that was a large repair shop operation, which even though the frame has collapsed, the roof and shop floor remain remarkably intact. It's rare nowadays to find a stamp dating from the Taiwan Kogyo period at Lin Tianshan. It's clear evidence that this lumber was milled before the war and used by the Taiwan Kogyo Corporation in the construction of this machine shop. The Gaoling site is still littered with reminders of the past, from the Japanese colonial period, as well as from after the Second World War. Though buildings have collapsed or disappeared, everyday items help tell the story of when many people worked and lived here. Wow, this is a find. It probably still works. I think so. Those things are indestructible. Yeah, nice. It's intact. Wonderful. This is the real thing. However, even as production steadily increased, Lin Tianshan's transfer to TPPC came with terms that hurt commercial success. TPPC was privatized in 1955, but still required to supply newsprint paper at low government-set prices, which hurt earnings. The TPPC board chose to divest from forestry, and in 1959, the provincial government-run Zhongxing Paper Company took over operations at Lin Tianshan Logging District. Again a government-run operation, Lin Tianshan and the Zhongxing Paper Company helped Taiwan achieve its goal of newsprint paper self-sufficiency and made the 1960s Lin Tianshan's golden age. Logging gradually expanded beyond Gaoling, deep into the central mountain range.
The residents of Morisaka, with steady incomes, plenty of good food to eat, convenient transportation, and good education and entertainment opportunities, were widely envied in broader society. Your work at Lintianshan could be in the mountains or down below, as traveling to and from the logging fields was inherently risky. When you worked in the mountains, you got a bed in the bachelor dormitory. When you married, you got a family dormitory. So workers rarely commuted back and forth. Everyone lived up there. In terms of compensation, apart from your base salary, you'd get overtime, incentive payments, efficiency bonuses, year-end bonuses, and welfare incentives too. That's why jobs there were in such demand. And why girls loved marrying forestry workers there. It was quite a unique phenomenon. My grandfather, father and brother-in-law all worked up here. There were basically four groups here. Post-1949 Han Chinese, Han Taiwanese, Hakka, and indigenous Austronesians. Everyone treated each other as equals, got along quite well together. People here were content and happy. Public water was free and electricity was cheap. There was a market where you could buy most things. Seasonings, condiments, tea, whatever. There was even a medical station. You had everything you needed up here. Passenger rides were free too. My friends from Guangfu and indigenous towns in the area all said, you're lucky to go to school in Lintianshan. As a new teacher graduating from NTNU, the provincial government sent me to Sunrong Elementary at Lintianshan. Originally, each grade had just one class with 40 to 50 students. Later, this grew to two classes per grade, so 12 classes in total, with around 480 students at the school, which made it a fairly large institution. At the height of the boom at Lintianshan, everyone was making a good income, with excellent perks and benefits too. This helped keep student quality high. The three best schools in the county were Lintianshan Sunro and Da Jin and Mingli Elementary Schools. These three continuously tested highest on the national entrance examination for junior high school. Education was important to administrators here and the teachers were dedicated, so there was a good vibe back then. I purchased that movie theater film projector. We had over one million NT dollars in the welfare fund. So part of that was used to buy two commercial film projectors. They cost 190,000 NT dollars. The movies were leased and there were at least one to two screenings a week, sometimes as many as four screenings. After school let out, elementary school students would rush on over to the admin office. Why? To check the latest movie schedule. When they saw what was coming, whoa, they were always so excited. The word spread like wildfire and to the neighboring communities as well. We had a full-size theater screen. People from Guangfu and Fenglin too regularly came to Lintian Shan to watch movies. So on movie nights, even though it was well after dark, the entire village was brightly lit. Job stability and the hospitable community vibes inspired workers and their families to form the cultural work team drama troupe, which put on concerts, dances and plays that were always well attended. The troupe earned a growing reputation and started performing across the country. The cultural work team was created to let workers have some fun. They put on dramatic performances, dances, magic shows, and variety shows. Team members were all us workers. I played the viola. We went on the road to perform for soldiers, performed at the sugar factory, and at the Hualien County government, and at the Veterans General Hospital. Lin Tian Shan and Zhongxing Paper Company were kind of famous back then. At its peak, 
Over 2,000 residents lived and worked in Lin Tian Shan logging district. As both a paper company logging operation and an idyllic community, Lin Tian Shan was a place its residents were invariably proud to call home. Ming Yi Zhuang's childhood was pleasantly spent at Lin Tian Shan. Now 65 years old, Ming Yi hopes to fulfill an abiding wish. While longing deep in the mountains, his father helped build something atop Mount Gaoling. Ming Yi hopes to see it once again. The place we are at now is Gaoling Lookout, which sits at an elevation of about 2,480 meters. Its main function was keeping a watch out for wildfires across the logging district. When one was spotted, you could use the landline telephone here to immediately update nearby workstations. A secondary function was doing regular meteorological observations cloud cover, temperature, rainfall, and information like that. Based on the forestry lookouts we visited, Gaoling Lookout is in remarkably good condition. The smell of cypress is still strong inside, even after almost 50 years. The magnificence of cypress wood structures of this material is still clearly apparent. For me, Gaoling Lookout holds deep and vivid memories. I never came here as a child, but did hike up in 1984. Afterward, I talked about it with my dad. I asked him, building on such a high and remote spot, were the materials first sent up and then everything assembled on site? Fortunately, Dad was the head carpenter for this lookout project. He told me, for this lookout project, all of the lumber was pre-cut in our workshop to blueprint specifications, then assembled, disassembled, and then sent piecemeal up the rail and cableway for reassembly on site. That's how it was built. Mortise and tenon joints were used even in the stairway and railings. That's why I feel like I can still feel my father here in this place. I really feel it. It was my main reason. This trip has been one of my fondest hopes. It's been tough, painful, physically, but my feet and I still made it. I walked all the way up. It's truly a blessing for me. Moving further in beyond Gaoling takes you to the number five cableway, Gaodeng, Gaodeng Log Rail Line, and then to Xingao. This section and the surrounding forests were first opened up for logging by Zhongxing Paper Company. Building the Gaodeng Log Rail Line ended up being Lin Tian Shan's costliest project. Starting at Gaodeng, this 34-kilometer-long line passed Qitsaihu Trailhead and Xingao on its way to Lin Tian Shan Section 98 on the border of Danda Logging District in Nanto County. The line took over a decade to complete. Expectations ran high that the Gaodeng line would spark a new logging boom at Lin Tian Shan. But these hopes were dashed when a wildfire that began on March 21, 1972, incinerated a huge swath of Lin Tian Shan. 
before expanding into Dandar logging district. The loss was devastating. As soon as the mountain started burning, the forest office created a firefighting team and set up a command post on site. We got our orders and went up there to fight the fire. Based on that experience, I can tell you, fighting a mountain wildfire is tough work. Our strategy was to try to stop it using fire break lines and otherwise to let it burn to a riverbank. It couldn't burn past that. It would burn itself out. Afterward, we'd send in our guys to snuff out the live embers and any small fires still burning. We'd spray water from buckets. That one was really a long burning fire. The worst part was the rail line burned up. The fire consumed all of the sleepers and some of the bridges were consumed as well. Basically, it was a total loss. Fell timber, timber fields, trees left standing, they were all caught in the fire zone. Most things were severely damaged or destroyed and the affected area was huge. The Forestry Bureau classified Gaodeng as part of Lintianshan Section 102. So in front of us, there would have been Section 100, which still looks rather barren. And you can still see scars from that fire. Some of the treetops are charcoal colored. The reach of that fire was incredible. It burned across sections 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, all the way to 100. It burned for a whole month and devastated the whole area. That was where the Shingao Log Rail Line, also known as Gaodeng Line, ran. It was a huge loss. The ashes blew down the mountainside. Cinder ash, you know. It was so dispiriting. We really wanted to put it out, but it was out of our control. Logging operations came to a complete halt. Operations changed drastically after that. And in 1973, the Forestry Bureau took over from TPPC. This disastrous forest fire, combined with cheaper paper pulp imports, rising logging costs, and increasingly tight profit margins led TPPC to cede its operations at Lintian Shan to the Forestry Bureau on July 1st, 1973. This formally ended Lintian Shan's role as a paper pulp supplier and transferred control of its forest resources to the Mugua Forest District Office. However, despite the change at the top, the residents of Lintian Shan continued on as before. Some had lived here since the colonial period. Many had spent their entire careers here. And others were born here, went to school here, took jobs here, and raised their families here. At Lintian Shan, all were equal bridging ethnic groups and the gender divide. All were colleagues, classmates, and family. Camaraderie and friendship prevailed. As long as logging continued, life would continue humming along. However, a sudden change in policy weighed in on the fate of Lin Tian Shan. In 1975, the Executive Yuan announced the reform plan for Taiwan forestry operations, which prioritized land, soil and water conservation, and de-emphasized commercial logging. The forestry sector shifted from logging to conservation, and new business development opportunities. Logging continued during this period, and the Wanrong Forest Trail was opened as a truck access route. However, output remained far below its peak and costs continued to increase. In 1983, Lintian Shan was reorganized as Lintian Shan Station. Although logging ended on Lintian Shan, there was still work to be done. Lintian Shan was a station administered under Mugua Forest District Office. Log railway operations ended here. Although cableways and log rail lines at Halun and Lanshan continued to run. 
So Lin Tianshan's equipment was dismantled for reuse. Because it was so long, the rail line stayed where it was. It was mostly the skidders and train engines that were removed after operations on Lin Tianshan ended. In the end, even the cableway was disassembled. News of the end of logging spread quickly. What will we do after logging ends? was on the lips of all at Lin Tianshan. Younger residents left to look for work elsewhere. Some older residents went with them too. Lin Tianshan was facing an unprecedented exodus. In 10 years, the 2,000 plus strong community had dwindled to fewer than 500. With falling student numbers, the kindergarten and elementary school also shuttered their doors. Oh, oh my really head's completely collapsed. I retired over 10 years ago. This is my first time back. It's heartbreaking. <laughs> Our school rooms were on both sides of the hall and my organ was in the hall there. I'd play the organ and the kids would march out. They'd walk up in one line this way and another over there to their assigned spots in nice even rows. They sang the morning song and raised the flag. Next, they would do calisthenics and finish up with the school song. Hwati Although logging ceased in 1989, reforestation work proceeded apace. The Mugua and Yuli Forest District offices were merged into the new Hualien Forest District office, and Lintian Shan and Wanrong stations were combined. Regular transport into the mountains ceased as well, and service stopped on the Wansun line. The workshops fell silent. Zhongshan Hall stopped showing movies. Many dormitories lay vacant and the exodus of residents continued. Lin Tianshan, once a hive of activity, was increasingly silent. Some residents, sure of a silver lining, weren't ready to give up on their community. But where to begin? The residents began talking about how to bring the good days back to Lin Tianshan. Some of the younger residents and those interested in community development began work on the Art Homecoming project with Hualien's Cultural Affairs Bureau. Later, this project helped draw Forestry Bureau attention to this issue. Helped by cultural historians and scholars, a cultural workshop was opened at Lin Tianshan with the Community Development Association organizing exhibits of local forestry history, artifacts, and photographs. Lin Tianshan gradually gained more local, regional, and national attention. In 1999, 
The Hualien Forest District Office, in consultation with Lin Tianshan residents, began planning for a forestry culture park that would transform Lin Tianshan into the premier forestry culture destination on Taiwan's east coast. I reported to then-director Wu Xiangguo that, with Lin Tianshan's long forestry and cultural heritages, we should take an overall planning approach that's different from forest recreation areas, create a forest culture park. That way, we could preserve the area's forestry heritage and culture. Visitors would be able to appreciate Lin Tianshan's past and present, and would picture her in her glory days. He said, great, I like that idea. We dove into the planning phase. If a workshop or residence was occupied, we crossed it off our list. Culture needs a community. The remainder were unoccupied. Empty workshops and dormitories were ours. Nobody was using these. We took a faithful approach to restoration. After I was finished and all the cosmetic work was done, the buildings looked like they originally did. With active community participation and help from Hualien Forest District Office and outside agencies, planning work on a wholly unprecedented forestry culture park at Lin Tian Shan was finalized in 2001. And the painstaking process of restoring Lin Tian Shan's wood framed buildings, such as Zhongshan Hall, manager dormitories, the director's dormitory, the community dining hall, rice dispensary, and clinic had begun. The unfortunate destruction of Kongla New Village in a fire during the restoration simply elevated the sense of urgency to realize Lin Tian Shan's renaissance. In 2006, Hualien County registered Lin Tian Shan as the first forestry heritage related building group under the Cultural Heritage Preservation Act. The new park was soon flooded with visitors, eager to explore both Taiwan's forestry past and this historical logging community. Lin Tianshan's new glow was something that both current and former Lin Tianshan residents had long hoped for. Lin Tianshan is our home and our root. The restoration of our heritage and the return of our young people can only make Lin Tianshan better. Even better days are ahead. We are eager to share our heritage. In 2014, the Hualien Forest District Office held a banquet and concert to welcome home its former employees. Long lost friends were reunited in a truly emotional and memorable event. The event is now held biannually and is regularly attended not only by former employees, but also by their children and grandchildren. Yeah! New generations of the Lin Tian Shan community are coming home. In 2018, the Lin Tian Shan Forest Heritage Association, now run by Lin Tian Shan residents, reinstated the traditional Mazu Parade with help from Hualien's Cultural Affairs Bureau and the Hualien Forest District Office. This was once a community-wide celebration and the district's only universal holiday. Lin Tian Shan used to have a three-day holiday around May 1st, Labor Day. Some of the forestry workers would come down and stay in Lin Tian Shan to join in this festival. Today, this activity tells people, our Lin Tian Shan abides. Our culture is still here. And our forestry heritage needs everyone's help to keep it moving forward. Twenty nineteen marked the centennial anniversary of forestry work at Lin Tian Shan with a kaleidoscopic array of events held in the park in celebration. Researchers, local history workers, and village leaders gathered in the forestry exhibition hall for the Lin Tian Shan Forum 
to share field survey results and review 100 years of Lin Tianshan history. Elsewhere, Ming Yi Zhuang led public tours of the community, sharing with visitors his love of Lin Tianshan. So many former employees and their families made the trip back to Morisaka to share their memories and nostalgic joy. The scene that greeted them was warmly reminiscent of the old days when Lin Tianshan was busy and bustling. Determination saved Lin Tianshan from extinction. Action restored to the community its former glow. People ensure Lin Tianshan will never be forgotten. In thinking about history, remember those who lived those experiences, who braved the difficulties and experienced the joys. All of Taiwan's ethnic groups contributed to Lin Tianshan's development. Today, Lin Tianshan Forestry Culture Park operates synergistically with its environs, working closely with residents and villagers to ensure a mutually sustainable future and to write the next century of history, a brilliant and new story of Lin Tianshan.